right, so we are reading out of Numbers chapter 13 this morning, uh, titled my message this morning, Obstacles or Stepping Stones. So uh, here we go, Numbers chapter 13. We're going to read the whole chapter of Numbers 13, and then we're going to go through a little bit into chapter 14. Starting in verse 1, it says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. I want you to see that part right there. Which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man. Everyone a ruler among them. And Moses, by the command of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. And these were the names of the tribe of Reuben, Shemua the son of Zachor, of the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hori, of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, of the tribe of Issachar, Ilgal, the son of Joseph, of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshia, the son of Nun, of the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu, of the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodi, of the tribe of Joseph, namely of the tribe of Manasseh, Gadai, the son of Susi, of the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamali, of the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael, of the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, the son of Vafshi, of the tribe of Gad, Guel, the son of Machai. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshia, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. It's another name for Joshua. I want you to notice that too. Moses called Oshia, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad. And what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether they be wood therein or not. And be ye of good courage, and bring up the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south, and came unto Hebron, where Ahimon Sheshai and Talmai, the son, the children of Anak were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eskal and cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bare it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook of Eskal. Because of the cluster of grapes, which the children of Israel cut down from there. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and they came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came unto the land where you sent us. And surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, the Amalekites, dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, and by the coast of the Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people. In other words, he hush the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. 
chapter 14, verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. The whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would God, that's another way to say, I wish we would have died in Egypt. Or I wish we had died in this wilderness. And wherefore has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. And once again, I titled this morning's message, Obstacles or Stepping Stones. Now, you know, this is a little bit of a lighter note, but you know, the sons of Anak, if you remember, in another spot in the Bible, it talks about the Anakim. And that's, that's another way, to, to another terminology to say the sons of Anak. Anybody that's a Star Wars fan, if, you're, if you remember the, the truth, whenever they came back with the newer versions, then we found out Darth Vader's name was Anakin Skywalker. And that's actually where George Lucas got the idea from, is from this story here. And so if you can imagine going into the land and seeing a bunch of Darth Vader's there that you have to fight, that was the problem. But in reality, that's the whole idea behind, that's where he got the story, really, was from the Nephilim, from the giant, the giants that were in the land. We're not going to get in, well, I mean, real quick, I mean, we teach this a lot in this church, but we know that the giants of the Nephilim were the offspring of the fallen angels and the daughters of men. A lot of preachers don't teach that or preach it because... People just think it's sensational, but I'm here to tell you that, and I don't really have time to break it down a whole lot. Uh, I'm here to tell you that I'm convinced that in the New Testament, it bears it out really clearly that that's what took place. And what we need to understand is this. What we gather from that is that we're in a real war. We're in a spiritual war. Those same Nephilim, those men of all men of renown that the Bible spoke of in Genesis chapter 6, when they died, Goliath was one of them. King David killed Goliath when he was a young teenage boy. Whenever those spirits were released from those bodies of those giants, then those are the demon spirits that inhabit the land. Those are the demon spirits that Jesus cast out of people. And we're still at war with the spiritual, if you will. I mean, Paul said in his letter, he said, we don't war against flesh. And blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, against world rulers. What we need to understand is that there's a realm that we battle against that we can't see with our physical eyes. And what happens is, is that the enemy of our soul is desiring to move us away from God's will for our lives and, and really to, to strike fear in our hearts and to prevent us from walking into what God has for us. That's why I titled this morning's message, Obstacles or Stepping Stones. One of the things that we need to realize is that on this journey that we're walking, we are going to come against circumstances in our life where there's going to be obstacles that stand in the way. Obstacles that attempt to prevent us from walking in what God has for us. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is this, will we look at the obstacles like the children of Israel and will we feel defeated before we even move forward? Or will we realize that the God that we serve is bigger than the obstacles that we face and that really they're just an opportunity to be a stepping stone to move us in the right direction? So God told Moses to send spies into the land. And, then, and, I, and, you know, I wanted you to emphasize or I emphasize the point that God said that he was going to give the land to them. Amen. And I don't think it's an occur it's just a coincidence that the place where they that, that's mentioned that they spied out was called the Brook of Eschol, which is where they got that cluster of grapes. It's literally what it means is a cluster of grapes. And the reason that I say that is because I know from the New Testament God, that God desires for his people's lives to be filled with fruit. Amen. Now, in this particular situation, that cluster of grapes was so big it had to be tied to a pole and two men had to carry it. So it was a very fruitful land, a very fruitful cluster of grapes, if you will. But whenever we're talking in the New Testament, repeatedly, it talks about fruit. It talks about the fact that God desires for his people to produce fruit. Now, this really wasn't part of my message, but what is fruit for a Christian? You know, you can ponder that for a moment in your mind. I mean, if you want, we're pretty informed when you can, you don't even have to raise your hand. You can shout out what your opinion would be if you wanted to. I would be okay with that. But, you know, typically what fruit, now some people would describe, well, 
fruit is what I do for God. That is true. There, there's a big part of that. But ultimately, the fruit, at least the way I see it as a preacher, I'm a little bit old school. Uh, some people may not think so, but I believe that I still have some a little bit old school in me. Fruit to me for a believer is that we re reproduce after our own kind. You know, whenever you talk about Jesus said that he said, I am the vine, you're the branch. If you abide in me, which means to dwell somewhere or live somewhere, you will produce much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. When you separate a vine, the branch from the vine, it loses its connection to the nutrition source. Within a tree or a vine, if you will, uh, there, there's a sap that flows and feeds and nourishes the branches that allows them to be able to produce fruit. Jesus is the vine. The great plan of God is the root system, amen, and the sap is the Holy Spirit that flows through Jesus into the branch, which is you and I, which allows us to produce fruit. Now, the good news is that fruit has something contained in it. What does it have? It has seed. And whenever seed is removed from the fruit and it's given somewhere else, what does it do? It reproduces after its own kind. So the fruit of the Christian is that more Christians are produced. We don't produce them. God produces them through us. The word of the Lord comes through us in some way, shape, or form. The light of God that is resident on the inside of us. Hallelujah. You did know that when you got saved, the Holy Spirit made his home inside of your heart. Amen. And now you're a light in the midst of darkness. And the point that I'm trying to make is this. I don't think it was an accident or a coincidence that it was the, the brook of Eschol, where this cluster of grapes was that God sent the people in to spy out the land because God desires for his people's life to be full of fruit. Amen. Praise God. And so God wants your life to be full of fruit. Now, one of the big differences about the way that I believe one of the things about the way that we believe in ministry, at least in this church, or as long as as long as I'm the leader, uh, the pastor of this church is, is that. Is that what fruit is or what the purpose of the ministry is, is that once again, we shine our light in the midst of darkness. That's right. It's not that we make the community a better place. It's not. The fruit is not that we are going to make the community a better place. Right. I always say this kind of thing and I can't help it because I got a bad attitude. The fruit is not that we partner with the community and we have an Easter egg hunt on Easter. And everybody's now happy because we all come together. No, that's not that's not the fruit of the church. Sorry, and if they don't like that, I'm not. If they think that I'm being a, a, a whatever, a stick in the mud or whatever you want to call that, that is not the fruit that Jesus was talking about. Besides the fact that Easter is the name from Ishtar, which is a false god, you know, we're not even going to get into all that. OK, but what I will say is this, is that it's not about just making people happy and, and, and being now being accepted by the community. As a matter of fact, the majority the church was not accepted by the community. In most cases, the church was rejected by the community. The truth is this, is that in order for fruit to be produced, that the Christian has to shine their light in the midst of a darkened world. You don't have to be contrary to everybody, maybe like I am. You don't have to, to, to try to be a confrontational to everybody, maybe like I am sometimes. But what you do have to do is let your light shine and be separate for Jesus. We're not the world, folks. We don't do everything that the world does. The Bible's real clear. God has called his people to be separated from the world. Amen? Amen. If we look to the children of Israel and where they are in their history in this story, we can compare it to the life of the Christian and learn some things about what God expects for us. Number one, they had been Egyptian slaves, right? They had been Egyptian slaves and they had been in bondage to the world of Egypt. But God proved his power and he set them free from the bondage of the world. Can you put Colossians chapter 1 verses 13 through 14 up there? So what we see in many of you that have been coming to this church, we, we talk about this really repeatedly, and we talked about it last on Wednesday because we were preaching out of Exodus. 
But Egypt is a type of the world and Pharaoh is a type of the enemy of our soul and Israel is a type of God's people. And God delivered them out from Egyptian bondage. God delivered them out from the world. They were slaves to the world and the way he did it was through a lamb that was a Passover lamb. Jesus was crucified on Passover. Amen. He is the type of the Passover lamb. He is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. God freed us from the bondage of the world that we were born into as slaves through the shedding of the blood of the Lord. And when we put faith in that, we became the people of God and we were delivered out. This is what this scripture talks about in the New Testament. Who has delivered us. Okay, here we go. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. We were delivered from the power of darkness. We were translated from one kingdom to another in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Redeemed means to be bought back. We were purchased not with gold or, or, or the currency of the world. We were purchased with the precious blood of the lamb. So just as Israel was delivered through the blood of a lamb, we too were delivered through the blood of the lamb. God has written the story at least twice in order to get a hold of his people to make them aware of what he's doing. So he's delivered us from the bondage of the world and he set us free through Jesus. And you know... You would think that that would be enough for Israel. And you would think that that would be enough for us. I mean, if you've really been saved, you know what I'm talking about. If you've really been saved and you felt the presence of God on the inside of your heart, you know how real that is. Now, when Israel saw God show up in Egypt, they saw him deliver them with the power. I mean, there were all those plagues that we talked about Wednesday. The frogs, the flies, the lice, you know, the lice, the locusts, the, uh, the, the river turning red like blood. All of these plagues that are taking place. And God yet at the same time showed them, and then finally the death of the firstborn. God revealed and delivered them. And he said, I'm going to do it with a mighty hand. He proved himself to them. God has proven himself to you and I. Yet at the same time, just like Israel, even though God delivered them, and even though God delivered us, sometimes we find it so hard to believe that he's going to be able to get us to the next step in the leg of the journey. Sometimes it's just, and sometimes it's because people aren't even really saved. You do know that, right? I mean, and I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just saying, I like to bring this point, though. Just because you believe something in your head does not mean that you're truly saved. Just because you whispered something with your lips or even spoke something with your lips doesn't mean that you're truly saved. It's taken me a while to come to this conclusion, but I'm here to tell you that it's the truth. You could have sat in the back of a church one time and somebody prayed, asked you to pray a prayer and you could have repeated that prayer. But yet at the same time, you really didn't get saved. Well, how can that happen, preacher? Because you believed it here, but you never believed it here. When you believe it here, a miracle happens. According to Ephesians 1.13, what happens? You get sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. When the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, something for real happens. Something changes. And then once again, it doesn't mean that everything goes the way that God wants it to go. Because we, as God's people, many times are obstinate and stubborn. Sometimes it's so difficult to get through to people. Especially when they're not saved. God wants, amen, to lead us and guide us every day in truth and bring us to the place of victory that he has prepared for us. Amen. That's what God wants for us. He wants to lead us into the place of victory that he has prepared for us. As a matter of fact, I'd like to make that point. I mean, I don't want to get ahead of myself because it is one of my points. But that's really what the promised land is. That's really what Canaan is. It's the place that God prepared for his people, a place of victory, a place of rest. It's not the end point. It's not heaven. Canaan in the promised land for Israel is not heaven. Sometimes we get confused about that. No, because see, there's a millennial reign of Christ. That's heaven for the nation of Israel. God, Jesus himself will rule and reign upon a throne on the physical earth. That is the end result for Israel. The, the, the Canaan and the promised land was a place of rest for them. It was supposed to be a place 
a victory for them where God was going to fight for them. So what that means for the Christian is, is this, it's the place of rest for you and I. It's the place of victory for you and I. Even once we've been delivered out of the bondage of Egypt, the place of Canaan, the promised land for you and I as Christians is this place known as in Christ, in him. In whom? What does that mean? A place where through the revelation of the gospel, we begin to realize that God has already won the battle for us each and every day. That the victory is secure because Jesus won it at Calvary. And that if we would learn how to keep our faith in God's plan, then the victory would be ours and the victory would be secure. And we would find rest for our weary souls. We've been over here working our fingers to the bone. We've been over here trying through how much scripture we quote, how many times we go to church, how many ministries we're involved in, how much we pray in order to try to get victory over the power of sin when the whole time Jesus already defeated the power of sin when he died at the cross. Am I saying you don't have to ask forgiveness? Absolutely not. What I'm saying is we got to learn how to allow Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross to be the object of our faith for us to keep our faith focused on him, amen, and what will happen is God responds with grace. Amen. He reciprocates with grace. He allows grace to flow into our lives, to give us strength to walk for him. The whole time they were in the wilderness, God wanted to prove himself to them and bring them into the land of promise where there could be rest and victory over their enemies. But they were so focused on what they didn't have. That's all they focused on. We don't have food. We don't have water. We don't have Moses because he went up on the mountain. And the things that they used to have in Egypt. Oh, I remember the garlic and the melons and the leeks. That's all they could remember. They, they focused on the past. They focused on the world. They remembered what the world had for them. How many, how many of you know Christians do the same thing? After they get saved, even though God delivered them with a mighty hand out of Egypt, they oh, man, I just remember that situation over there. Oh, life was so good back then. But no, no, it wasn't. It really wasn't good. Uh, God's moved you on, and he's delivered you out of that. They could not keep their eyes on and trust God to provide what they needed. Like I said, similar things happen to Christians. If you put Mark 4, 18 through 19 up there, in the parable of the sower, <clears throat> the Lord talks about this. You remember the story? He said a sower went out to sow. The idea is he got a pouch of seeds in his, on his side. He grabs handfuls of seeds and he just slings the seed. Some of the seeds fell by the wayside. Some of the seed fell on stony ground. Well, some of the seed fell amongst thorns. Jesus explains the parable. And he says, and these are they which sown among thorns. The seed that fell amongst where thorns were. Such as hear the word. So the seed is the word. People are hearing the gospel. But sometimes, and the seed is planted in your life and in your heart. But sometimes the seed falls where there's thorns also in your heart. Right? And he explains, the thorns are the cares of this world. And the deceitfulness of riches. And the lusts of other things. Entering in and choke the word. And it becomes unfruitful. There's things just like Israel was looking backwards at what Egypt offered them. There's things in the life of the Christian that he looks backwards at what he used to have or he looks around at what everybody else has and sees that he doesn't have what they have and he becomes so consumed with all of these material possessions, all of these worldly things that he can't keep his eyes on Jesus. He can't keep his eyes on kingdom business. He can't look towards the eternal because he's so consumed connected to the temporal that it begins to eat away and choke away the fruit of the gospel in his life. Matthew 6, 19 through 20, the Lord said this. He said, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust corrupts and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupts, where thieves do not break through nor do they steal. God, Jesus is telling us, and, and, and I've been preaching this for three years, so I think maybe I'm preaching it to myself more than I'm preaching it to you. God is, desires to convince us that this life that we're living is temporary and that the only thing that really matters is the fruit, which is the souls of men. 
Amen. That's where God's heartbeat is. I mean, don't misunderstand me. He is so concerned about your individual life. He's so concerned about the things that are going on in your house. He wants peace to be in your home. He wants his will for your life, for your children, for your spouse, for your family. Amen. He wants that for his people. But ultimately, he wants us to be able to see beyond the temporal and to be able to see what it is that he's doing as he's creating the eternal family of God. Number three, even though they really weren't trusting him, he was still, I like this one right here. Even though they weren't, talking about Israel, really trusting him, he was still faithful and that he led them daily in the right direction. Remember that? He gave them a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They weren't trusting him. And yet still, God was merciful and kind enough to lead and guide them in the right direction. Now, when I stop and think about this, because I'm telling you, I love to do some critical thinking, like start dissecting and stuff. And think, I'm like, I kind of got to scratch my head on this a little bit. Because wait, hold on a second. 40 years they wandered around in the wilderness, but God was the one that was leading them. He was the one that told them when to get up and when to move. He was the one that told them where to go. He was the one that was leading them the whole time. And yet they wandered around in the wilderness. And I started thinking about the fact, not only that, but he led them to specific places that to the natural mind caused all kind of conflict in their life. He led them to places where there was no water. As a matter of fact, he led them to places where there was bitter water. Now he had an answer. Throw the tree in the water. It's a type of the cross to make your bitter water sweet. Amen. But nevertheless, each time he led them somewhere, what did they do? They typically murmured and complained, and they never really trusted him when it was all said and done. Then I remember the scripture out of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. God had a purpose for Israel. He purposefully led them to places where these conflicts took place because he was purposefully trying to do something for his people. Deuteronomy 8.2 You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee. You know what that word prove means? It means to put to the test. God puts his people to the test. He puts us to the test. And guess what? And he also knows how to humble us. Maybe you've never had pride issues. I don't know. Control issues, pride issues. Lord knows I've had them. He knows how to humble his people. Look at this. To know what was in your heart. Whether you would keep his commandments or not. God purposefully each and every day allowed the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night to tell Israel when to get up and where to go. And he purposefully moved them in directions to places where there was going to be conflict that was going to take place to cause them to reveal to them. See, whenever, whenever God allows things to take place in the heart and lives of his people, it brings chastisement. It causes, look, in the, I meant to put the scripture back out of 1 Peter, I believe it's chapter uh, one, I think, uh, up to verse 9, it talks about the trying of your faith is more precious than gold. Just as gold has something called dross in it, which is an impurity, that the refiner puts fire to it, it causes the impurities to rise to the top where they can be removed. Sometimes we find ourselves in the midst of circumstances where we're like, oh Lord, get me out of this mess. And the Lord's like, no, I, put, I allowed you, I led you to this mess. To humble you and to prove you, to show you what was in your heart. God's a good God. See, he says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. He says, if you endure chastening, that means the correction. The word in the Greek is pedia, which is where we get our word pediatric from. It's the instruction. like Just like you would instruct your child, God instructs his children. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards, meaning you're fatherless. And you're not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasures, but he for our profit, 
that we might be partakers of his holiness. See, just as Israel, God led them to certain places for 40 years, and his purpose was to humble them, to put them to the test, and to reveal to them what was in their heart. God allows trials and tribulations in the heart of the believer to reveal to us the things that are in our hearts, the things that are in our lives, to chastise us, to bring correction to us because he loves us. And when we see those things in our lives, the proper course of action is supposed to be that we realize sometimes there's things that are bigger than us. Sometimes the sons of Anak are there, and they're really big. The cities are walled, and they're very fortified. And we know that we can't win. See, God, I haven't got to it yet, and I don't want to get ahead of myself. God never intended for them to win on their own. That's the message of the gospel. Jesus said, come unto me as little children. Jesus says, uh, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You will find rest for your weary soul. Jesus is the worker in this relationship. Jesus' death on the cross gives us access to the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the person of the Holy Spirit working in our lives that, that, that sanctifies us, that purifies us, that, that does the work that you can't do. Do. You can. You should pray to the Lord to get deliverance for your life. You should seek the scriptures on how to get deliverance for your life. You should come to church in order to hear the truth of the gospel. But just you doing those things in and of themselves are not what's going to ultimately set you free. What ultimately sets you free is when the Lord, through the trial, through the chastisement, makes you realize you can't do it on your own. Independent of him, you're going to fail, but he will bring you to a place of surrender and cause your heart to become humbled and to surrender and to look to him. And when he sees a humble heart, see, he resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. When he sees a humble heart, what does he do? He responds through grace. He reciprocates through the power of the Holy Spirit. And now, Lord, I can't deal with this thing. This thing's bigger than me. This is a son of Anak in my life. Lord, I need you to cause this giant to fall. Hallelujah. And just like little David, as crazy as it sounds, with one stone brought Goliath to his knees and cut his head off, God, with a, with a cross, allowed power and victory over sin. 1 Corinthians 1.18 The message or the preaching of the cross is to them who perish foolishness, but unto us who are being saved, it is the power of God. God's power moves and operates through the truth of what Jesus did at Calvary. I'm not talking about two physical pieces of wood. I'm not even talking about the physical crucifixion and all the torture. Not that I would ever want to forget that. I'm talking about spiritually, in the spiritual realm. What God accomplished by allowing Jesus, the sinless one, to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sin. The devil doesn't have an ace in the hole. Hallelujah. It's all out in the open. The penalty's been paid for. No devil, you're a liar. I'm not guilty, not because I've done it all right, but because he did it all right. And he took my sin on him. Hallelujah. And there was an exchange that took place. He gave me the gift of righteousness. Now I can boldly enter the throne room of grace. I can go to the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit can move and operate in my life. God can give me strength and victory. Even the sons of Anak have to fall under the power and grace of God. Amen. Amen. Three things that we can learn from Israel's experience. One, God's people walk by faith, not by sight. Amen. You know, the words that we speak often reveal the way that we think. For Israel, their words reveal their hearts. If we look at a couple of these scriptures, can you throw up there? We're going to just go through them quick. Numbers 13, 27. When he got back to give the report, it said they told him and said, we came to the land where you sent us. It looks good, but the main part I want you to see is there. We came to the land where you sent us. Look at verse 32. It says, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto. So they went to the land. This is how they referred to the land. It's the place where you sent us. 
is the place that we went and searched, right? They never once said this, Numbers 13.2. See, this is what God said about the land. Numbers 13.2, it says this. God says, send down men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Oh, it's the land where you sent us. It's the land that we went and searched, but they never referred to it as the land where you sent us. God, no, I'm sorry, they never referred to it as the land where God said, I give it unto you. The victory was the Lord's. The possession belonged to him. He was giving it to them. In their minds, the way that they felt in their heart was that it was just impossible that they couldn't gain the victory. But God said that he was giving them the victory. Let's look at uh, Numbers 13.33. This is what's in their heart. This is what they see. Numbers 13.33 says, And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in our own sight. This is how they view it. The obstacles are so big, and we're so small. They're so strong, and we're so weak. Numbers 13.28. It says, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Their giants were grasshoppers. Their cities are walled. It's too big. It's, it's too big of an obstacle. We can, we can never accomplish it when the whole time the Lord made it clear that he had given them the land. Everywhere they looked, they only saw defeat because they walked by sight. And not by faith. They refused to believe the word of the Lord. And instead of trusting God. They looked at their own weakness and inadequacies. inadequacies and saw only failure. Paul says that we the people of God. Walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5. 1 through 9. Now I have to tell you that. You know. A lot of times whenever. Uh, preachers preach messages. They. They preach a certain thing. They'll just take scriptures and they'll quote it uh, to go along with what their message is. It'd be a lot easier just to say we walk by faith and not by sight and not actually go to this passage of scripture. Because to make the context right, you got to kind of dig in a little bit. All right. And so we're going to do that. We're going to study the Bible too. All right. It says. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands. So what is he even talking about right there? Anybody have a clue? We can talk. He said he's talking about our earthly house. He's talking about this physical body. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about this physical body. He says, for we know that we have an earthly house of this tabernacle because the Bible says that we are like the tabernacle of old, that the Holy Spirit lives in us. Once this house is dissolved, talking about this physical life is over, we have a building of God to look forward to. Amen? A house not made with hands, it's eternal in the heavens. So there's a, there's a glorified body to look forward to. All right, next verse. For in this we grow. We desire to look forward to the day when we will be clothed upon with our glorified body. Earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Amen. We long for our glorified body. Next verse. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Hallelujah. God sent Jesus to die on the cross so that we could be clothed with his righteousness. Because we've been clothed with his righteousness, one day we will also be clothed with a glorified body. We're not going to be found naked. Good news, Adam and Eve found naked because of the sin. Hallelujah. But we're not going to be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle, physical body, do groan being burdened. You ever felt burdened before? You ever felt tired and worn out like the children of Israel? You ever felt like you were facing the children of Anak in walled cities? The obstacles were too big. That's what he's talking about. We're, we're, we groan. We, sometimes things don't go the way we want them to on this earth. Not for that we would be clothed, but clothed upon. We are looking for that day when we will be with the Lord. That mortality, talking about this humanity, the weakness of this human flesh, will be swallowed up of life. That this physical journey is going to be over one day. That we're going to have the eternal to look forward to. Amen. Next verse. Now, he that wrought us for the selfsame thing is God. What does that mean, wrought? We've talked about that word before, King James, Old English, for like wrought iron, something that's produced. 
Whenever you make a wrought iron fence, you, you see how they twist it? They make it ornamental. It, God's been working. That's what a die did. He wrought, he produced us for the self same thing. For what? For eternity. God's producing a people. He's producing a family. Right now we're the tabernacle of God and the Holy Spirit lives in us. God has produced this. He's also given us the earnest of the Spirit. See, the earnest of the Spirit. The down payment. When you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. That's what it says in Ephesians 1.13. He's given us the earnest. It's the first portion. When you got saved and the Holy Spirit came to live in your heart, you say, you know what? I'm different now. I'm a new creature in Christ. But it's also, it's also letting you know that there's something to come Amen. in the future. Uh, the earnest of the Spirit. Next verse. He says, we're getting there. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. Now, that's when in the next verse, he says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So as long as we're in this body, in this phys on this physical body, in this physical earth, then we're absent from the Lord. We can't see God. We can't necessarily always feel God like we want to. We can't even always hear God like we want to. But nevertheless, we walk by faith, not by sight, knowing that each and every day we're going to continue to live for the Lord. He's about to tell us why this is important. All right. Next verse. We are confident, and I say willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We'd rather go home to be with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Unless you're just waiting for your next thing. I ain't waiting for no grandkids. They done told me they ain't having them. Next verse. <laughs> Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Next verse. See, he's talking about labor now. Whether we be present or absent... We're going to labor for him. We want to be accepted of him. That means he put us here for a purpose. We want to be acceptable unto him. You can only be acceptable righteous wise because you accepted his, through faith, his gospel message, which was the sending of his son. Because of that, you were given the gift of righteousness. Now you can be accepted, but you got work to do on this earth. Work to do for him. He's explaining. He says, look why. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. What does that mean? What is the judgment seat of Christ? It's not the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is whenever people are going to either go to hell or heaven. The judgment seat of Christ is where your works are judged. It says that we're all going to have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. Rewards based upon what you did while you were in this physical body on the earth before you received your glorified body. Even though we can't see God all the time. <laughs> if you've ever seen him. Uh, even though we can't hear God all the time. Even though we can't feel God all the time. Even though sometimes the obstacles look big like the sons of Anak. Even though sometimes the obstacles are like walled and fortified cities and too big and strong for me to get through. Nevertheless, we walk by faith, not by sight, because we serve a God that's bigger than the obstacles we face. Plus, he put us here for a purpose in order to accomplish his will upon this earth. And one day he wants to reward us for the work that we've been put here to do. Now, listen, the way that we make that connection, I know that was a long <laughs> way to break that down to make the connection but the way we make that connection is that God had work for Israel to do God wanted them to inhabit the land God wanted them to be a light in the midst of darkness God wanted them to trust him that he could deliver them in and bring them the victory that he had for them so that they could live for him and that the heathen world that did not know him could also know him and God wants the same for us today amen we walk by faith and not by sight. That was point number one. We walk by faith and not by sight. Point number two, <clears throat> I said it already earlier, but Canaan is in heaven. Canaan is in heaven. Instead, it's the place that God has prepared for his people to do what he's called them to do. So it's kind of like just a little bit more commentary on what we just talked about. God's plan was for Israel to dwell in the land of Canaan and to be his people. And a light in the midst of a darkened world. And the same holds true for us. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. 
I explained it a little bit, but let me let me be clear again. You know, Canaan, the promised land. I don't know that I need to be this technical, but I like to teach the Bible. Canaan, the promised land, was the land of promise. It was supposed to be a place of rest, supposed to be a place of victory from their enemy to where they did not have to, uh, you know, that God was going to go to battle for them. God was going to win the battle for them. And ultimately for Israel, heaven is the place where they will rule and reign as the nation of God in the millennial reign of Christ. Um, for Israel today and also for us, the place of rest is that place called in Christ. You remember how we've talked about that a bunch of times? The prepositional phrase, in Christ. How it says that in the New Testament, like I've been told over 170 times, in Christ. You know, you, you, you told, we, we talk about this, this secret place. How many have ever heard of the secret place? Come on, you can raise your hand. The secret place, right? And, and in our mind, or at least when I first started talking about the secret place was after my sister died and it was tragic and I started to worship the Lord. And as I started worshiping the Lord, I felt the presence of God. You know what I'm saying? I was like, because I was broken and I had become to a place of surrender and I sought God and he showed up and I felt his presence and I was like, oh, this must be the secret place that God was talking about. <laughs> Found it. Oh, hallelujah. It's like the fountain of you spiritually, man. It's like oh, the fire of God, right? Well, guess what happened? And I've shared this before, but before you know it, I started thinking if I don't get up at four o'clock in the morning and keep doing this, I'm about to lose the secret place. <laughs> but I realized that the secret place isn't what Matt does. The secret place is being in Christ. Understand, and don't get me wrong. You can be in the secret place, but still choose not to seek after God and not be able to feel his presence. That's not God's will either. God wants us to understand that the secret place is being in Christ and now to seek after his face and to be able to feel his presence, to grow in our walk with him, to feel our relationship with him in the grace of God. Amen. And so I wanted you to see that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, for we are his workmanship. The idea there is that we're being created, we're being crafted, we're being molded. One of the scriptures says that we're being conformed into the image of his son. We're his workmanship, we're his creation, created in Christ, created, look at that, in Christ Jesus. Unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Canaan or the promised land was the place of rest and victory that God had prepared for Israel to do the works that he had planned for them in Christ is the place when you put, you, you might not have even known this, but when you put faith in Jesus, you are already in Christ. Amen. And, but sometimes it takes a while. First off, we need a preacher to tell us what it even means. Then once he tells us, the Holy Spirit begins to reveal to us. This may be a bad illustration, but then again, it may not be just as a baby in utero physically matures and is nourished and grows up physically. You and I in Christ are growing up and being nourished and maturing spiritually. We're his workmanship. He's creating us. He's preparing us. He's building us up. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Lord knows we all need help. It ain't just a preacher that needs help up here this morning. It ain't just a preacher's sneaking attitude whenever, whenever you know, people don't do what I want them to do. Amen. Come on. It's not, I'm not the only one with that problem. No. I just know that I'm not. I, it, it, we all need to grow up in Christ. Amen. We all need the Holy Spirit to do a work in our hearts. Amen. Amen. We all need, and not just for what we want to do. Sometimes the Lord asks us to do things that we don't want to do. Has anybody ever been there? Or am I just preaching to the crowd? Lord knows that there's been plenty of times that the Lord asked me to do stuff that I didn't want to do. And he still does. And sometimes I'm like, Israel, no one listen. I guarantee you there's been times that I... The Lord said, you can go tell your, that person you're sorry. But they don't even know I did anything wrong. <laughs> I didn't even, I, I fought something, God. They don't even know I did it. You're going to go tell that person you're sorry. It's called humility. I got to learn how to be humble to him. 
Amen. obedient to him. Amen. It doesn't matter what man thinks. Amen. I've learned that too. I wish I could keep it in the forefront of my mind. I'm so worried about what man's going to think about me, but what all I need to be really worried about is what God's going to think about me. If I can be in right standing with the Lord, he's going to go to battle for me. I mean, I have seen this time and again in my life. Things that he's asked of me that made no sense, but whenever I did it, all of a sudden he responds with grace. He responds with grace. He gives strength. And the next thing you know, hallelujah, God's going to battle for me. That's a good thing. That's a good place to be. Yeah. Amen. So just as God created the nation of Israel out of one man, Abraham, he is also creating us in Christ. And once again, it's almost like we're that baby being created, being nourished, being matured to be able to do the work that he's called us to do. Amen. Number three, this is the last point. He does not expect you to do it yourself. I think this was my favorite part my favorite point, just because it was something new that I learned. All right. When we look at how big the giants are and how tall the walls are that fortify the city and we realize that God wants us to do things for him, we can become overwhelmed. We've said that several times this morning. We just look at the situation. We're looking by sight. We're not trusting by faith. I'm like, God, you want me to walk in there? You want me to go do that? I can't do that. God never told them that they had to do it. He knew that they couldn't do it with their little weak bodies. He knew that they couldn't do it. They were just a little ragamuffin group. He never expected them to do it. God doesn't want you to do it in your own strength because he doesn't want you to get the glory for it. He wants to get the glory Amen. for it himself. Amen. He's the only one that's able Amen. to be glorified. Now, my point here is very simple. What is the point? He doesn't expect you to do it yourself. The way I'm making this point is a very simple thing, but it was revelation for me. Numbers chapter 13, verse 8. I've never seen this before. This is good stuff right here. I, sometimes the word is so simple. It says in Numbers 13, 8, of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshia, the son of Nun. Y'all know who that is? Oshia? We read it earlier. Go to Numbers 13, 16. That's another variant form of Hosea, by the way. That word Oshia is another way to say Hosea. So, I mean, the prophet Hosea. I noticed Danielle was teaching on Hosea, so I shared this with her when I saw that. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land, and Moses called Oshia the son of Nun, Jehoshua. Look at that. Joshua. Moses changed Oshia's name from Hosea to Joshua, from Oshia to Jehoshua. What he changed his name from was Hosea means salvation. Joshua means Jehovah is salvation. The point being is this. God never expected Israel to do it themselves. God was going to do it for them. And what you and I need to understand is that God never expected for you and I to get victory over sin ourselves. He sent Jesus, which is the Greek form of Joshua, hallelujah. Jehovah is salvation. God had a plan the whole time. Just as he promised to give victory to Israel of old through Joshua, the, the, the leader and the deliverer, he sent us Jesus, the, the New Testament Joshua, the fulfillment of the Joshua type, to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for sin, to redeem us from our sin, to reconcile us back to the presence of God, so that the presence of God can go before us and give the victory. The sons of Anak have to fall. The fortified walls have to fall. The obstacles turn into stepping stones because God showed up. Hallelujah. And his power rules and reigns in the life of his people.